Nicholas Ludwig Count von Zinzendorf was a wealthy Austrian noble born in Germany. In 1731, he was visiting Denmark, and there he met a converted slave from the West Indies. The former slave was looking for someone to return to his homeland to preach the gospel to black slaves. Zinzendorf was moved and returned to his estate, where he had allowed a Moravian community to settle. He recruited two volunteers to go to the West Indies. They became the first Moravian missionaries and the first Protestant missionaries of the modern era. As Zinzendorf commissioned them to go, leaving their families, their wives behind, he famously gave them these simple instructions. Preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. As their boat slipped its berth to take these two men to work as slaves on the sugar plantations, those two men called out to their loved ones on the dock and said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And they meant, of course, may Jesus receive the worship from the tongues and disciples of all nations. May he who was slain for the sins of the world receive global glory from disciples of every tribe, every tongue, and every people. With one addition, I would like to use Zinzendorf's framework for my remarks today. If we are going to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples amongst the nations, we must love Jesus, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave himself as a propitiation for our sins. The very first missionary call is to love Jesus back and to revel at the wonder that Jesus loves us. In John 13, verse 3, we are told, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. I recently was a meeting, in a meeting in the Arabian Peninsula where a believer, a mature believer from Saudi Arabia, shared the devotional with us, and he was just reveling in the love of Jesus and speaking out of this text in John 13. And he pointed out to all of us who were leaders something that we had never seen in that text, asking us why none of the disciples stopped Judas when Jesus had so clearly identified him as the betrayer. He presented this hypothesis. Every act of the Passover meal had a historic Old Testament precedent. Each of the four cups was symbolic. Every portion of the meal had a sacramental holy reference, including when Jesus dipped the bread in the cup. Thus, all of these disciples, conversant with their own history, knew exactly what the meaning of that bread dipped in wine was, for it had happened before. And surprisingly, it only happened once in all of the Old Testament narrative, and more surprisingly, it happened in the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 14. When Boaz invites Ruth to dip her bread in his cup, and by so doing culturally, inviting her into a kinsman-redeemer covenant. So when Jesus invites Judas to dip his bread in the cup, he is doing so much more culturally than identifying his betrayer. He is viscerally and visually communicating to Judas, I love you to the end. Judas, I love you. Judas, I forgive what you have done. Judas, I love you despite what you're going to do. Judas, what you do, do quickly, but let the very last memory you have of me be a reminder that I love you, I've always loved you, I always will, and I extend to you even now in what you're about to do, kinsman, redeemer, covenant, covering. The refuge of my love is ever and always open to you. Judas, I love you to the end. 
And this Saudi believer said that the reason that the disciples didn't jump on Judas was because they were stunned. What? Judas is the favored one? Judas is the one that Jesus loves? Judas is offered intimate proximity and covering with Jesus? We didn't see that one coming. Jesus loves Judas? Yes, indeed. And aren't we glad? Because all of us are Judas. And we all have betrayed Jesus. And will shortly do so again. But the beautiful thing is that our love for Jesus is not rooted in us. He loved us first. And we love him back. He forgives you for what you have done. And he loves you for what you're going to do, even despite what you're going to do. Friends of ours, like yours, were ministers. They had a daughter with a lovely voice. She led worship in their church. Falling into sin, she betrayed Jesus, became pregnant out of wedlock. And to add sorrow to her shame, the baby died in the womb. Some years passed, and a young man came into her life. Knowing her sin and shame forgiven of his own, he fell in love with her and asked for her hand in marriage. On the day of the wedding, he stood at the front of the church. The organ music began. The doors at the back of the church were open, and there was his beautiful bride. He couldn't contain his joy. He bent over with his hands on his knees. Even that couldn't resolve the internal explosion. So he stood up and he lifted his hands, began to praise the Lord. Hallelujah! I love you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! But even that couldn't hold him in place. And so he bolts up the altar and he scoops up his bride into his arms, apologizes to her father. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. Carries his bride back to the altar. And there they play their eternal love and covenant to one another. Jesus knows your sin. Jesus knows my shame. Jesus knows that we will betray him soon. And Jesus loves us to the end. And he extends to us the bread dipping cup of kinsman redeemer love. He bounds up the aisle of life and sweeps us into his arms. He brings us to his banqueting table. His banner over us is love. We do not originate and we cannot sustain love for Jesus. We just love him back. And therefore, we never get too old or too jaded to sing. Jesus loves me this. I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The first critical step in making disciples that make disciples of all the nations is just loving Jesus back. For we cannot, in truth, Love the world if we have stopped or stuttered or waned in loving Jesus back. So we love Jesus. And then we preach the gospel. Preaching is central to the Great Commission. Matthew 24's version is prophetic. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all the nations. Mark's version is a command. And the gospel must be preached to all the nations. Paul will add in Corinthians, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. In Romans, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I have made it my aim to preach Christ where he has not been named. 
And we see in these texts, the gospel must be preached. We see it is the gospel of the kingdom. And we see that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the nations. Second Temple Jews had a very clear understanding of what the gospel of the kingdom meant. The term kingdom of God was not referenced in the Old Testament. The closest thing we have is Daniel 7, a kingdom set up that will never end. And yet it is shockingly unexplained in the new. And the reason was that those post-exilic Jews, they knew that the fallacy of the kingdom of God on earth had been shattered numerous times. Saul didn't end very well. David, adultery, murder, civil war. Solomon, perversity, idolatry, decadence. And those were the good kings. And never again, said the people of God, never again will we put our hopes in men as the agents of God's rule on earth. For we know, 1 John 5, that the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And the only hope and the blessed hope is when the king comes back. And only then, Revelation 21, will he alone make all things new. We don't make anything new. Nothing that man can do is sustained throughout the generations. All projects putter out and all movements eventually meander. And the kingdom does not fully come and they knew this until that day. And on that day, the king will come and he will judge the living and the dead. And not until that day will all be revealed and all be restored. And on that day, the wrath of God will be outpoured and we are saved by faith through grace against that day. For the gospel of the kingdom is simply this. God saves us. God saves us from God. God saves us from God for God. The love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. Friends, let us preach that gospel amongst the nations. We are not to preach sugar or medicine. We are not to preach self-help psychology. We are not to preach cutesy, comedic, courteous, little TED Talks. No, with fire in our eyes and love in our hearts, we are to preach the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. And if everyone loves our preaching, and if everyone speaks well of your sermons, then whatever you are preaching, it's not the gospel of the kingdom. Preach Jesus the King. Preach Jesus the Lord who is coming to judge the living and the dead. Preach the utter hopelessness of man to rule anything uncorrupted over time. Preach the cross and today is the age of mercy. Preach that the day of the Lord is near. The day of judgment is nigh and hell burns eternally hot. Preach that now is the moment of salvation. Preach heaven. Preach eternal life. Preach that the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glories of God. Preach the gospel of the kingdom to the nations everywhere all the time. Adam worked with us in Sudan. When all the missionaries were kicked out in 2012, our local partners were arrested. Some were beaten. Some were abused. One friend named Bashir watched others tortured and killed. Adam was locked in prison where he continued to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Hard to preach prosperity, health, promotions, and favor from a prison cell. He preached that the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. Not liking his preaching, the authorities in the prison assigned him to the toilet. A tiny space, three feet by three feet, with a stinking hole in the center. And Adam spent his days and nights there, curled around that overflowing hole as he slept. Pressed against the wall shamefully, for every time a prisoner came to relieve himself, Adam was not allowed to vacate the toilet. So what did Adam do? 
Because he loved Jesus, he preached the gospel. And every prisoner was preached to and prayed for. And every prisoner heard the good news. He preached, the king is coming. Repent. Now is the day of salvation. This world, this prison, will one day cease. But you can have eternal life in Jesus. The guards were confused why so many prisoners exited the toilet smiling. So one of them donned prison clothes to go in and see what Adam was doing. He entered the toilet as a prisoner. To him, Adam preached. The guards were shocked and so released Adam from prison in due time. Months later, Adam's sitting on a bus. A stranger sits down next to him. You might not remember me, he said, but I was one of your guards. You preached the gospel to me in the toilet. Please tell me again, how does the love of God save me from the wrath of God? And they joined hands in prayer on that city bus, and Adam led his new brother into the kingdom. We are primarily commissioned. We are ordered to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Not to build schools, not to drill wells, not to rescue the traffic, not to teach English, not to run businesses, not to feed the hungry. I do all of these blessed and commendable acts of love, as should you. But first, I am called to love Jesus, and second, I am called to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And third... We are all called to die. An anonymous missionary wrote, Our God bids us first build a cemetery before we build a church or dwelling house, showing us that the resurrection of the nations must be affected by our own destruction. My wife and I were recently on an island in the Middle East. It is completely Muslim. There is not one believer on that island. Some of the missionaries have been laboring there for 20 years. We sat with that small, valiant band, and one of the leaders told us, we've all gone in together and bought a piece of land. We fenced it, we tend it, we call it the everlasting ground. And we want to be buried here. It's our cemetery. For we have given our lives to the people of this island. We now want to give them our deaths. For on that day of resurrection, we will by faith rise with many of our local friends. Should Jesus tarry, we are all going to physically die. But there is an antecedent death required of every missionary and every minister. And that is dying to self. John 12, 24. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and die, it remains alone. If it dies, it bears much grain. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If we say yes to loving Jesus, if we say yes to preaching the gospel of the kingdom, we are also going to have to say yes to dying to self. All of you who are ministers know that no one calls you with good news at 3 o'clock in the morning. A friend of ours in Sudan named Sarah called with tears. Her 20-year-old daughter, a mother of a toddler, was dead. I drove to the hospital and loaded that barefoot corpse into the back seat of my double cab pickup. She was laid on the laps of weeping relatives. And I remember the print of her feet on the back window as her stiffening legs would not bend, and so I had to force the door closed against them. Played worship music in Arabic and drove to Sarah's home. She cried as she sang along, It is well with my soul. It was a full moon. The body was placed on a sisal rope bed in the middle of the courtyard. Mourners began to stream to the home through the night wailing. It was a simple mud house with simple mud courtyard walls. And I sat in the shadow against one wall watching, and then the Lord spoke to me. Go, lay your hands on that woman, and raise her from the dead. I argued a little bit, but eventually obeyed. Many weeping women sat on that bed, but I leaned through them 
put my hand on the head of the deceased and simply said, in the name of Jesus, rise. And the woman sat up. My heart leaped, but then fell again as the woman fell back prostrate. She'd always been dead. But when I had reached through the crowd to pray for her, some hefty woman sitting on that rope sisal bed stood up and the rope shifted. So the body jerked up and then just fell back dead again. She had never been raised from the dead. And at that point, I got embarrassed and angry. And so I left. And I got in my car, and I began to drive home, and I had a conversation with God. I trusted you, and now both you and I look foolish. And the Holy Spirit, in his gentle way, asked me a question in my spirit. If she would have been raised from the dead, what would you have done next? And after thinking, I had to confess to him, I would have gone home and written an email. I would have given Jesus the headlines, but made very sure that every supporter and every reader knew that I had been involved in raising a woman from the dead. And then Jesus softly said to me, until I can trust you with my glory, I cannot trust you with my power. It's not enough to physically die. Oh, yes, to be with Jesus on that day is far, far better. But what Jesus needs, if we are to make disciples and make disciples amongst all the nations, is for us to be dead now. For we don't get to resurrection power until we're 100% dead. Dead to popularity dead to glory, dead to position, dead to status, dead to reputation, dead to honor, dead to the applause of man, dead to all of this by means of crucifixion. I am simply saying this. Jesus wants us to love him, to preach the gospel, and to be crucified. In Psalm 116, verse 15, the text says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. There is something beautiful and precious to Jesus when his people die to self will. I know that the text probably refers to those who are dying in the faith, but I think we can also apply it to dying to self. Ronald Rollheiser said, Before you get serious about Jesus, first consider how good you're going to look on wood. And beloved, we can't get to that wooden cross alone. We can't crucify ourselves. We can't die to self in the power of self. We need others to help us die. Think about this physically. Can anyone really crucify themselves well? You might be able to drive one spike through your own feet and in a surge of adrenaline, writhing in pain, maybe grab another one with this hand and drive that nail through this hand. And if you, by some superhuman effort, were able to put a spike in your own feet and one in this hand, how physically would it be possible to crucify this hand? You can't physically do it. And it's true also spiritually. You cannot crucify yourself spiritually. And if you try, you just turn out like a super spiritual, self-satisfied prig that nobody wants to be around. So do you know what Jesus does? He takes the hammer and he hands the hammer to the one who is near. He gives the hammer to your spouse or your child or your board or your pastor or your follower or your friend. And he assigns them, the one who is near, to crucify you. And he asks you to like him and to thank them. Why? Because on the other side of death is resurrection power. And you do not get to resurrection power until you're 100% dead. 
Not 50%, not 75%, not 99% dead. If you wriggle off the cross that Jesus has assigned you, if you escape the blows from the hand of the hammer of the one that is near to you and you haven't gone all the way to the death, all you are is a mangled mess and you do not attain resurrection power. The only way to get to resurrection power is to be all the way dead. And when Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, he could only say that post-crucifixion because nobody gets to resurrection power until you're all the way dead. My wife Jennifer said to me a few months ago, we have lots of people who want to be martyrs, but not very many who want to die. She meant, of course, that we're all right with suffering for a little bit, get a few scars, then write the book, tell the tale, speak the circuit, hold the seminar, revel in the attention. And God says to that, until I can trust you with my glory, I will not trust you with my power. You want resurrection power? You have to be all the way dead. And you can't do that to yourself. The ones who are near have to be allowed by you to crucify you. And we're supposed to like it. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. First, because when we die well, he gets all the glory. Second, because when we die fully, we get resurrection power. And thirdly, and most preciously, there is a unique knowledge of Jesus only gained through dying. We know the Philippians 3.10 text very well. We like the first two clauses. I want to know Christ, hallelujah. I want to know the power of his resurrection, amen. What's next? And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. And what's the context for the sufferings of Jesus? The redemption of the nations. There is a knowledge of Jesus only gained when we suffer with him. There is a knowledge of Christ only attained when self is crucified. When we suffer and die, not because we're Republican, not because we're black, not because we're female, not because we homeschool, not because we vax or didn't vax or mask or don't mask. No, no, but because we left home and suffered and died to self amongst the nations for the redemption of the nations, there's a knowledge of God that cannot be found in your lazy boy at home with a coffee in your hand and a candle on your shelf and a chorus on the iPad. It can't be found in this air-conditioned church. It can't be found at a carpeted altar. It can't be found at a camp or a conference or a Sunday morning surrounded by Christians. There is a knowledge of Jesus that can only be attained when we suffer with him on the bleeding edges of the world. And when we die to self with him amongst the nations, there's a fellowship of that suffering that can't be found anywhere else. Do not be sorry for your missionaries. Do not be sorry for the persecuted church. In that crucible of affliction, they are experiencing a fellowship with Jesus and a knowledge of God that cannot be found anywhere else. We should have a holy jealousy. I want to know Jesus that way. Wouldn't it be wonderful, brothers and sisters, if our diagnostic question for one another when we gathered at events like this was not, so how many are you running, but how well are you dying? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And in that, there's a sweet knowledge of Jesus that cannot be found anywhere else. Love Jesus, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Frank Borham, in his book, A Bunch of Everlastings, tells the story of Hugh Latimer. I'll paraphrase it. Latimer was born to a family of farmers, studied Latin age four, went to Cambridge, was elected a fellow of Clare's College, ordained a priest and a chaplain, 1522. And at the time, he was highly against the Reformation. 
After his conversion, which I'll come to in a moment, he began to preach publicly, fearlessly, on the need to translate the Bible into English, courageous because that was illegal. He was called before Cardinal Thomas Wosley, admonished, he preached on. He became England's leading reformist, advocating the destruction of icons and religious relics. Latimer was beloved in England. He preached in the people's tongue. When he walked the streets, men and women would leave their work, stand and stare, many pressing in just to touch the hem of his garments. Because though he was a bishop, he acted like a commoner, he spoke truth to power, and the people loved him for it. He fearlessly attacked those in power, he bearded them in their own den, and the streets would cheer for him as he walked to Whitehall to preach another sermon on righteousness against corrupt politicians, shouting, Have at them, Father Latimer! He stood up to Henry VIII, was imprisoned in the Tower of London, and then when Mary came to the throne, again imprisoned, tried, condemned, burnt at the stake outside Oxford in 1555. You may not have heard of him, but I'm sure you've heard of what happened next. As he was being led to the stake, he said to his friend Nicholas Ridley, the Bishop of London, who was to be burned alive with him, play the man. Master Ridley, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. From Latimer's incandescent death in 1555 flow an irrepressible tide, John, give me Scotland, Knox, or I die, 1560. John Bunyan, The Pilgrim's Progress, 1678. Amazing Grace, John Newton, 1748. George Whitfield, 1770. The Wesley Brothers, 1788. William Carey, sailing to India, 1793. William Wilberforce, the abolition of slavery, 1807. David Livingston to Africa, 1840. Charles Spurgeon, 1850. Hudson Taylor going to China, 1854. All these and more burned for Christ, lighting their dark world from the light of the candle that Latimer so bravely lit in 1555 because Latimer was the father of the Reformation in England and from him all the evangelical presence in the North American continent largely descends and whether you know it or not, Latimer is your father in the faith. But who found Latimer? There was a little man, ugly. Nobody took notice of him. So insignificant that he was called Little Bilney. He was going to hear Latimer preach. Recognize that he had eloquence. This was before his conversion also recognized that he didn't know Jesus. And so Thomas Bilney, or Little Bilney, prayed this prayer. O oh God, I am but Little Bilney, and shall never do any great thing for thee. But give me the soul of that one man, Hugh Latimer, and what wonders he shall do in thy most holy name. One day as Latimer descended from the pulpit, he passed so close to Bilney that his robes almost brushed the student's face. Inspiration came to little Bilney's mind. Father Latimer, he whispered, may I confess my soul to thee? The preacher beckoned, went into a quiet adjoining room. The student followed, and Bilney fell at the feet of Bishop Latimer and poured out his soul, and this is what he said. I went to the priests, and they pointed me to broken cisterns that held no water, only mocked my thirst. I bore the load of my sins until my soul was crushed beneath the burden. And then I saw Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. And now, justified by faith, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And to the surprise of little Bilney, Latimer falls on his knees, repents of his sin, and little Bilney led Hugh Latimer to the Lord. And from that hour, Latimer lived that incandescent life from which we all benefit. O oh God, I am but little Bilney, and shall never do any great thing for thee. But give me the soul of that one man, Hugh Latimer, and what wonders he shall do in thy most holy name. And I tell you that to make this simple point. The mark of the greatest disciples is that they are forgotten. And no one remembers them. Because those 
that they disciple love Jesus more than they did, serve him more faithfully, live and die more graciously, minister more fruitfully than the one that discipled them. Nobody remembers little Bill Me. For the mark of the true disciple maker is the impress of John 3.30. He must increase and all of us must decrease. If we disciple well, Jesus will rise and we will fade and be forgotten. We love Jesus. We preach the gospel. We die. And in making disciples that make disciples, we are forgotten. And beloved, there is so much rest in being forgotten. Striving to be remembered, to be known, to be praised, to be respected, to be honored, to lead, to have status or position or voice or power. It is so fatiguing. And there is so much rest in being forgotten. Let's just be little Binleys. Let's just make disciples, make disciples of all the nations. Let's just love Jesus, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. There are now 8 billion people in the world. 3.15 billion of those are what we call unreached, gathered in 7,000 people groups, 42% of the world. And they have need of thee. 1,700 of those 7,000 don't have one missionary or one church or a Bible. What is most needed in the world today, what is most needed amongst the nations, is not programs, not money, not visits, not pity, not buildings, not projects, not blame. What is needed is you. The Lord has need of thee. What is needed is disciple makers, disciples that make disciples that make disciples. What is needed is little Binleys amongst the nations. And like that donkey and colt tied up in Jerusalem, Matthew 21, you've been happy in your current role. You have been serving faithfully. You've been doing your job. You have been content to serve at home. But now, some of you in this room are needed over there by the king. The Lord has need of thee. What is urgently needed in this hour for the unreached billions of the world are men and women who make disciples of all the nations, disciples that make disciples because they love Jesus, because they preach the gospel, because they die, and because they're forgotten. And if anyone would ask you, why would you be untied? Why would you be released from this successful church? Why would you be untied from this thriving ministry? Why would you be released from your assignment at home and reassigned to the nations when there's so much lostness and so much darkness and so much brokenness in southern New England. Simply tell them, the Lord has need of me. I'm just that donkey for Jesus to ride on into the nations. Just to be forgotten. Jesus is stirring you tonight by his spirit that no matter where, whether your assignment is to continue here or your assignment is to change for the shared calling of making disciples that make disciples of all the nations. And if there is something stirring in you, no matter the geography of the assignment, to love Jesus, to preach the gospel, to die and be forgotten, would you renew your yes one more time? by coming to an altar and pray. No music, no fanfare. That's in your heart. Would you come now?
wherever you are, would you make it an altar? And just with the holy quiet, can we just linger in the presence of Jesus and tell him, you still have my yes, Jesus. I'll love you. I'll preach the gospel. I'll die. And I'll be forgotten. Let's all find a place to pray. Jesus, none of our hearts are where they need to be, and we take your cautions and your warnings seriously. And, uh, Lord, forgive us for where we have mingled motives. And, and yet, Lord, in our imperfect way, we do love you, Jesus. And everyone here is here because we love you and we, we want to obey you. So even though we are imperfect in our obedience and our love, Jesus, and we repent of that, we do love you, and we want to say yes to Jesus. We want to give you a fresh yes, a new yes, an old yes. We just say, yes, Jesus, we're going to love you back. Yes, Jesus, we're going to preach your gospel. Yes, Jesus, we're going to die to self. Yes, Jesus, we're going to be happy to be forgotten that Jesus might rise and Jesus alone will be exalted and hallowed and honored and his name will be the only name great in the nations. We do love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus.